Do you believe that what we believe affects our behavior? Hmm? Yeah, and it, it is what the Bible teaches. Okay, and uh, but sometimes we take it for granted, like if it is not a big deal. Okay, it's not a big deal, and that's the uh, the mentality nowadays that it's not a big deal. You know what? We believe it's not a big deal what other churches believe, okay? As long as they believe in Jesus, that's it. But do you think that according to the scriptures? Do you think that's according to Jude, since we're studying Jude? Because remember, last week we started studying this, and, and Jude is very concerned, very concerned on what we believe. He was very concerned of what... The churches were experiencing. So he was concerned. So let's open our Bibles and we're going to read the first seven verses in Jude. And remember, this is the, the shortest book in the New Testament, only one chapter, Jude. So let's open the, your Bibles, your telephones, your tablet. But let's read it from the scriptures so that, so that we can see from the biblical perspective. Now, if you have it, let's begin in verse 1. Jude 1. He said, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you, about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe and the angels who did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Okay? So this is a warning from, from Jude, okay? half-brother of Jesus Christ. Because that's, Let me give you just a review, quick review of what we have already covered, that he is the author, okay? Jude. And he presents himself as a, as a servant of Jesus Christ because for him it was more important the relationship that he had now with Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior than as his half-brother. That's why he is so that people can know which Jude, because it was a common name, Jude, okay? like Pancho, like John nowadays. So Jude was a common name, but he's saying, but I'm the brother of James. Okay? And James was half-brother of Jesus, and, and by that time when he wrote, it was very well established, James, as the main leader of the Jerusalem church, the Christian church. So, so we know for sure that it was the half-brother of Jesus, Jude, okay? And uh, because those are the names that the Bible gives us of the half-brothers of Jesus. He said, they scoff. He's just the carpenter's son, and we know Mary, his mother, and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. Okay? So he's mentioned in the scriptures as a brother of Jesus. And this letter 
was written uh, approximately between 70 and 80 AD, okay? So it's one of the, the last letters written, okay? The, like I told you, John was the last one to write because he was the last one to die, and he wrote Revelations, but this is one of the, the last ones also. And the reason why he wrote this letter is very important, okay? The reason why he wrote is to warn us, because now we are the readers, now this letter is for us, that the apostates were already on the scene, okay? Why? Because that was what Peter had prophesy or warn us when he told us, Peter, but there were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be, you see? That's 24, 25 years before Jude that Peter is warning us, warning the church, hey, they're coming, okay? False prophets are coming. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies. You see, and that's cleverly, not openly, okay? So it, it is a warning, and that's exactly what James is, is telling us now. James is telling us this, look, they're here among us. They're already got into the church. They're already changing the doctrine of the church. And I want you to stand up for the sound doctrine that was already given to you, that you already know this sound doctrine that we are not supposed to be changing. It's unchangeable. It is the word of God. That's what we have given to you, and you have the responsibility to guard. So it's a call for us to take the arms. That's why the, the title of this series, A Call to Arms, Fight, Fight for sound doctrine work so we can persevere in sound doctrine. Why? Because it is very easy. And now, you see, through the years, that's been going on. The distortion of sound doctrine to the point that little by little, we start accepting it like normal. To the point where you see, we know the future, we know the prophecies that one day, one day, there's going to be only one church. We're going to be all united, kumbaya, one church. And that's, this is exactly the way it's going to happen. Little by little, we start saying, oh, as long as we have Jesus in common, that's all. Okay. Mormons have Jesus. Jehovah's Witnesses have Jesus. You know, who even revere Jesus, Muslims, they revere Jesus, they consider him. They, they read, they, they know that, oh, he was a prophet of God. Okay? So they revere Jesus. So little by little, we're going to start just saying, okay, well, that's fine. As long as they revere Jesus and they have him in good standing, that's fine. So little by little, we start deluding, deluding, deluding sound doctrine. Little by little, to the point that one day, we're all going to be together, kumbaya. One church, universal church. No more divisions, no more arguing, no more doctrines. All we're going to be united in love, the love of Jesus. Hmm. I remember those hippie days. That was the <laughs> And the thing that I remember the most is that I had hair in those days. <laughs> and long one, but well, that happens. That was my punishment. <laughs> All right. So this is what the letter of James is telling us. It's, it's calling us, okay? Calling us to guard that treasure that God has given us. And that's the way we have to see the word of God, like a treasure. It is a treasure. It's very valuable. So we have to keep it the way it was delivered to us, given to us. Why change it if it is perfect? Any change that we do, that we take away or that we add, is not going to be good because it ceases to be perfect. It's going to affect us because the Word of God, the way it is, holy, 
is going to create, is going to produce a lifestyle that is in keeping with his word. But if we change it, then it's going to affect us also, and it's not going to be for, for a betterment, but for the worse. Okay? So we need to be careful, and that's what James is warning us, and he's telling us, come on, okay? You're the army. We know the captain of the army is Jesus Christ. And through the scriptures, he's telling us, hey, you're, you're the soldiers, okay? You are the soldiers, those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. You are the soldiers. You are responsible. You are responsible to keep this sound doctrine that was delivered to you once and for all. So if you notice here, that's the teaching in the New Testament, that God's revelation was final once and for all. That's why even Jesus himself you know, revealing to John in the book of Revelation, it tells, hey, no adding and no taking away from the scripture. The revelation is perfect. It's complete. What do you want to add to the scriptures if, if the Lord has already given us even a look at the future? That's the meaning of the word revelation. Is the opening of the curtains so that we can see what's going to happen. So what else do we need? What else do we want? It's already closed. Revelation is perfect. It's complete. So why adding? Why distorting? What, why changing? Why removing? And that's what James is afraid. He said, oh, no. It's happening again. The same thing that happened in the past hmm, with our forefathers. The false prophets now are here. Hmm. False teachers are here. False teachings, distortion of the scriptures are here and are affecting people, affecting the church. It's going to affect them, okay? So that's why, what are we to defend? It says to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people to keep without change through the years. Notice, notice what the Word of God is telling us, okay? Defend the faith, okay? And I want you to understand that I know that many people believe that by faith, they see it as something mystical, something mystical. It's not mystical, it's teaching, okay? It's revelation from God, it's words written that, those words that were written, that we have them in the Bible, reflect the mind of God, the mind of God. So this is what he's telling us to defend, okay? Not a feeling, not an emotion, not a sensation, but the truth that is already written. Defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time. You see, it's close. Is forever and ever. You're not supposed to, to change it. I, we already gave you everything that you need. So now you have to, to keep it to his holy people. To keep. To keep how? Without change through the years. Without change through the years. And that's what I've been telling you. That through the years, they've been changing. Changing and changing and changing the scriptures. To the point that, that we say, well, this church believes this way, this church believes that, uh, this way, so ah, why argue? Let's just say that we're all right. We're all right. So we're all right. So we're really in, on our way to one universal church with no divisions, no fights about doctrine, everything is fine and dandy, and just united in Jesus, that's all. That's exactly the church that the Bible in the book of Revelation is warning us that it's going to come under condemnation because it's a false 
church is the church of the false prophet. The church of the false prophet. We have the Antichrist and the false prophet. The Antichrist, mainly he's going to be focused on, on politics and the false prophet are going to be working together and he's going to unite all the religions, all the churches to become one. But that's the one that, that when the judgment comes, when Jesus comes, it's going to be judged. Okay? So it's not the right thing to do, to say, oh, okay, we're all the same. Let's just forget about doctrine and, and let's get just together in, in love. Because that's not what the Bible tells us. And this is what we should be defending. Sound doctrine, sound doctrine, defend it, defend it. That's what we are supposed to do. Because this false teachers, false prophets, false pastors, false elders, whatever you want to call them, because remember, this, this warning is very profound because what, what uh, Judas is telling us is that they're coming into the church not just to sit. Like we just went through the lukewarm. A lukewarm is a, a non-believer that pretends to be a believer, but he sits and he just listens and he's indifferent. But in this case, they are leaders. Okay? They want to lead the church. They want to teach the church. These are false prophets, okay? false teachers, false pastors. Okay? And the very first thing that you're going to see that is attack, and it's here, is the divinity of Christ. And we already covered that last week. The divinity of Christ is attacked. Because it says here in verse 4, part B, and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Okay? And James is once again letting us know that the original sound doctrine is that Jesus is, was, and is God himself. Sovereign. Lord. Lord of lords. But... They're saying that he is not God, that it, he couldn't be God if he, if he had flesh, human flesh, that he could not be God because God is a spirit. That was their argument. And many say, yeah, that's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Even Jesus said that God is a spirit, so he couldn't be God. So he was just a man. And, and like that, they distorted the scriptures. So they denied that Jesus had those two natures perfectly together in one person, 100% human, 100% God. But they deny that. They deny the divinity of Christ. And how many churches, like I was telling you last week, mm, not only religions, other religions denied the divinity of Christ. Like I was telling you, for example, the, the Muslims, they, you know, they pay tribute to Jesus. They celebrate the birth of Jesus, but only as a prophet, not as God in the flesh. Not like the, the Bible presents, and the word became flesh. And we saw the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace. And No, nothing like that. It's just a man. Okay? Just a man. And that's another religion. But those other religions that are considered Christians, that do the same thing. That are considered, they don't consider him to be God. They consider him to be an angel or consider him to be a great example for us to follow, a great prophet a great moral teacher, but not God. You know, and, and little by little, those teachings are creeping into the churches. Like I was telling you, even denominations, Baptists, Methodists, all the denominations, they have their liberal wing, okay? Liberal wing. And those that are in the liberal wing, they don't believe that Jesus was God. They don't believe that Jesus, they don't even believe that he was born on, from a virgin. Because 
believing that he was born from a virgin, that he had a virgin birth, you know, that's dangerous. That's really giving him, acknowledging that he was God, that he was more than human. So no, no, no. So there's no such thing as a virgin birth. They don't believe in the virgin birth. Okay. So the second attack, we already covered that one, the, the attack on the divinity of Christ. The second attack is on the grace of God. Okay, on the grace of God. And you see, the grace of God has been so attacked through history that even nowadays, okay, nowadays among evangelicals, and we are evangelicals, okay, among us, we even have problems understanding the grace of God. We have problems understanding the grace of God. It is considered that many evangelicals that sit on a Christian evangelical church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, still foggy the idea, the teaching of the grace of God. Because while they think they understand it with their feelings, behaviors, and understanding, they tend to to one extreme or the other extreme on the grace of God. Like many believers, they believe that, well, you know, I'm glad that I, that I came to church and that I already received Jesus. So, you know, now I'm going to do my best to really be accepted by God. So you see, and they have a mentality like, like if it is a combination. Yeah, the grace of God is something foggy, but now I have to behave and do this. If not, uh, I'm not going to make it. But I believe that by coming to church and by listening, I'm going to be learning and, and I'm going to try. I'm going to do my best. And, and so they think that it's a combination of grace and works or faith and works, faith and works. Because they don't, they don't have a, a, a clear idea of, of what the grace of God is all about. And that's why they even came, there are churches that came to a point where, where they say, hey, you can fall from grace. Can you imagine? Do you think they understand the concept of grace when they say you can fall from grace? And that means you lose your salvation. And, and like what I'm telling you, and what, that's what James is warning us, that it's going to affect whatever we believe is going to affect our behavior, our emotional state. It's going to affect us when we accept those doctrines that are not according to the scriptures. Are going to affect us. I was talking to a person that believed that you can lose your salvation. I said, okay, tell me, what sins can make you lose your salvation. And he started, well, hmm, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, because I'm pretty sure you're going to mention things that you commit. And you're going to be losing your salvation probably every day. So what's going to happen? Are you going to have to get re-saved every day? And re-saved every day? Because now you lost your salvation? While others go to the other extreme, like I was saying, the, the distortion that, that has crept into the church, others go into the other say, oh, no, that's a very legalistic way of looking at grace, that you can lose your salvation, that once you s commit a sin, then you fall from grace, and now you have to once again be reestablished and all that. Say, no, grace is grace, and they present it in a way that tells you, so it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you do. You can live any way you want. You are under grace. And that was the position of these people. Because look, it says here in, in verse 4, they are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into license for immorality. Okay? That's the other extreme, that's the other distortion of God's grace when it's distorted to the point that you say, yeah, 
I can do whatever I want. I remember one time speaking to a couple that were, they were just living together. And then I told them about marriage, about, but they say, Pastor, we are under grace. Oh, so now because you're under grace, you have permission to be in fornication. So now because you're under grace, fornication is void. Mm -hmm. Everything is fine. You can live any way you want because you're under grace. Yes, Pastor. Yes. And you see, because we're not perfect. Nobody's perfect that they told me. Nobody's perfect. So that's where grace comes and covers us. Okay. So that's the grace of God. And look, warned. We were warned. And this is what Judas is telling us. Hey, fight for sound doctrine. That's not the right doctrine, even if it sounds appealing. Why? It sounds appealing. Why? Because we're sinners. So it sounds appealing to have, you know, something like this and say, oh, yeah, nobody's perfect, so I can yield to my temptations because, you know, the grace of God is greater and bigger than my sin. Wow. So now I can do whatever I want because the grace of God is bigger than my fornication, bigger than my adultery, bigger than my drug addiction, bigger than my lies, bigger than my stealing, bigger than anything. I can live any way I want because grace is woo, greater than sin. So this is what happened here. But notice how Judas is presenting these people. He says, they are ungodly. Okay? So that means that this kind of distortion is going to lead us to behave in an ungodly way. You see, it's going to affect us if we truly believe the way they believe, the way they distort the doctrine of the grace of God, then we're going to be like them, living ungodly life. Okay? What does it mean, the word ungodly? Okay, it says ungodly people. It means without God. Without God. In reality, once you fall into that distortion of the grace of God, what James is saying about them is, is because they truly don't have God. They're not true believers. They're not true believers. And because they're not true believers, they're just giving the people what they want to hear. Okay? What they want to hear. Because, you know, if we are honest, we would rather in our flesh, in our humanity, in our sinful nature, we would rather have a gospel or a teaching from God that we can live any way we want, that we can satisfy all our desires, all our passions, and we are still right with God. Right? If you're honest, you know, I'm being honest, I'm confessing that, oof, that would be wow. But it's not according to the scriptures. It's not according to the scriptures. So they come and they know how to manipulate people. And now they're telling them, hey, it's time for you to be free. You've been in shackles by Peter, by all these so-called apostles, especially that one that is not even an apostle Paul, and telling you about this and that, when in reality the grace of God, and then... Oh, yeah, that's right. You're right. Oh, now I can do what I feel like doing because I'm already under grace. That's the, the way they come. Now, the idea of ungodly means that they don't have God. So, therefore, the mentality 
of a person that doesn't have God in his life. He could be an atheist, or he can be a person that claims to believe that God exists, but in reality, God is not in his life. Okay? The idea is God does not exist. Therefore, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Hmm? For tomorrow we die. So why? Why put in the brakes on your desires, your what you really want to do? Why put in your brakes if maybe today you're gonna die? Just enjoy life. Enjoy it. To, and to enjoy it to the fullest is do whatever you feel like doing it. Regardless, look, you're already a Christian, you're under grace. So do whatever you feel like doing. So it, it sounds attractive to the flesh, to our humanity. It sounds attractive, but it's not according to the scriptures. Mm. Now, why do they pretend to be Christian teachers or prophets of God? Okay, why? What is the benefit? What is the benefit? Is it just to destroy the doctrine, to destroy the church, to to harm people. No, they, they have the reasons. Look, Peter tells us, and he was looking ahead, okay, prophesying, many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. So they're gonna be successful. They're gonna be successful. And because of these false teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. People are going to say, look, uh, Christians are a bunch of hypocrites. Look at them. Look how they live. They're a bunch of hypocrites. That's slander. We're going to be rightfully criticized negatively because we're following wrong doctrine and that wrong doctrine that distorted doctrine is leading us to do things that the world are going to be able to see it clearly and say oh come on you're false so look and now verse three in their greed okay because the question is why do they pretend to be christian teachers or prophets of god what is their motivation, and it says their greed. They will make up clever lies to get hold of your money. To get hold of your money. So they, they realize, hmm, a good way of making money, easy money, is just by getting into the church, pretending that I'm a prophet, I'm a teacher, I have revelations from God. I have a new teaching from God. And now I'm going to teach this new teaching from God. And many will believe me. And I'm going to be able to get their money. And woo, I'm going to have fun. And not only money. Not only money is their motivation. Okay, But Peter is telling us, be careful. Because that's what they want. They want your money. And not only that. Look, he tells us. In verses 14 and 19, Peter says, With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and accursed people. So the pleasures and the money, that's their motivation. Pleasures and money. Sex and money. Isn't that powerful? That's very powerful. It is believed that those are the most powerful things that exist in this world. Hmm? Sex and money. Those are the two gods that compete with the true God. Pleasures and money. And that's what they, that's the way they are deceiving people. And that's their motivation for doing what they, they were doing, okay? So he's warning us. Is that my phone or yours? No, it's over there, right? Okay. 
All right. So this is the, the, the reality, okay? And this is the way they distorted the grace of God. And have you ever been tempted in accepting the grace of God as an excuse? Well, not, not as an excuse, but as a basis for doing something wrong? You know, because you are already under grace. If I'm already under grace, well, I shouldn't be too hard on myself. I shouldn't be too hard on myself. There's nothing wrong with, you know, doing this, doing that. You know, besides, you know, we love each other and uh, we're going to get married. And, uh, you know, th there's nothing wrong with this weed. God gave us weed and it's good. And, and I can, I already researched all the benefits that I, and we come up with so many things. Mm -hmm. Even Jesus drank alcohol. So why not me? And then we come up with so many excuses and say, besides, you know, I don't want to be a legalist. I'm under grace. I don't want to be a legalist. I'm under grace. Have you ever thought like that? That's the distortion of the grace of God. That's the distortion. Because distorting the grace of God could be a little distortion, or it could be a very big distortion, because when we see this, we say, oh, that's huge. Yeah, that's a huge distortion of the grace of God, but we can distort the, the grace of God a little bit. But we distort it, and, and that's what Judas is telling us. Be careful. Wrong teaching, wrong belief, wrong doctrine is going to hurt you, because we can start little, distorting it, just, just a bit, you know, let's say that they distorted the, the grace of God, all this big. And we're only distorting it like this, so it's not a big deal. But that one is going to become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It's just the beginning. And that's why we have a warning from the scriptures. No, don't do it. Fight, it's telling us. Fight against that. Fight against that, not accept just a little bit. No, it's the fight against it. Don't accept it at all. It's going to hurt you. It's going to harm you. It's going to affect you. Okay, That's not according to God's will. So that's why, let me show you. It says here in verse 19, they promised them freedom. Oh, you're going to be free from legalism. They promised them freedom while... They themselves are slaves of depravity, for people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. Hmm? Whatever has mastered them. And that's what, that's the result of distorting the grace of God. The result is that we are allowing some sinful practice to master over us, hmm? to control us. Little by little, little by little, little by little, that thing is going to keep growing and having more control, more mastering us more and more and more. And that's what Peter had already warned about them. And then Paul makes a clarification about God's grace. Notice the difference. So Paul, he's telling us, look, this is, the right way of looking at God's grace. Okay? This is the right way. And then he says in Titus 2.11, he says, For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. Okay? So the result of the grace of God is salvation. Hmm? Salvation. You're going to be free. And you're not going to be enslaved. You're going to be free. That's what it means, salvation. Verse 12. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. 
So he's telling us, look, these are the fruits of the grace of God. These are the fruits of the grace of God. You're not going to live a godless living. You're not going to following sinful pleasures. No, not at, that was from your flesh. That was when you were not a Christian, the old man. But the new man that is under grace now live with wisdom, with righteousness. Righteousness, what's the meaning of the word righteousness? In right relationship with God. That's the meaning of the word righteousness. In right relationship with God. So now you live with wisdom. Wisdom means that you're going to be able to see clearly what's right, what's wrong. What is godly, what is ungodly. What is from God, what is not from God. That's what it means to, to have wisdom. And also, it goes a step farther. Wisdom. Not only you can see, you can tell, you can understand, but now you are going to do it. What you see that is the right thing, you're going to do it. That's a wise person. Not only that you have the knowledge, okay, but that you live that knowledge. If you read the whole book of Proverbs, you're going to see that lesson. Proverbs is about wisdom. And you're always going to see that the wise person is the one that is doing the right thing. Okay? He knows the right thing, but he's doing it. And the fool, see, because the book of Proverbs, it's, it's a comparison. It's always comparing the wise and the fool, the wise and the fool. And the fool knows the same thing that the wise, but he's a fool because he's not living it. He's not practicing it. He's not obeying it. So that's why he's a fool. Not because he's an ignorant. No, he's not ignorant. It doesn't call him an ignorant. It calls him a fool. Why? Because he knows it, but he doesn't live it out. And, and that's what it says here. We should live in this evil world, in this evil world that is constantly tempting us to live contrary to God's will, we should live with wisdom, knowing the truth, putting it into practice, in righteousness, in right relationship with God, by obeying Him, in devotion to God. That means serving God with, with passion, with love. So you see the results of the grace of God? Completely different from the distortion of false teachers, false prophets, that they tell you, oh, come, come on, don't be so hard on yourself. Oh, you're under grace. It's not a big deal. It's just that legalistic pastor that you have. It's bringing guilt and guilt and guilt to your life when you're free. You're free in Christ. Oh, sounds very appealing to the flesh, but it's not what the Bible teaches. That's why... Paul had to clarify. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, we don't have time to go through many other verses, but this is just an example of, of this real product of grace. Okay? Now, it says here in verse 13, while we look forward with hope that that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. So he's telling us, look, I want you to, to truly live under grace. This way with wisdom, with righteousness, with devotion to God. Look, all the days that God gives you. And always with the hope that this could be the day of his coming. This could be the day of his coming. The wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. He's talking about his second coming. He can come any moment. And he's telling us the best way that we can live is in this way, under the grace of God, under the real grace of God. And then you'll be ready to face him. You're not going to be ashamed to be in his presence. No. No. Because you've been living 
in grace. Okay? Now, how could false Christians get into true congregations? Because what Peter warned and prophesied, now it was a reality in the days of Judas. It was a reality. They were already in the churches, teaching, leading, distorting the truth, leading people astray. How? How can that be? Well, you know, there's two sides of that coin. One is, this, it says here, for certain people have crept in unnoticed. Okay? Crept in unnoticed. And the Amplify gives us the meaning of that. It says, just as if they were sneaking in by a side door. So we can, you know, in, in one way say, oh, well, that's the excuse. You know, they were so sneaky that they sneak into the congregation without even noticing. Suddenly, they were already in the pulpit teaching and leading. Oof. But this is just for us to let us know how it happened. But we are not excused for allowing this to happen. Okay? We are not excused for allowing this to happen. Why? Because it happened because the soldiers, we are the soldiers, had gone to sleep at the post. Hmm? At the post. You know, how many years I've been a pastor of this congregation? Woo! <laughs> About a thousand, a million hairs ago. Okay. <laughs> That's when I first came. <laughs> okay. So it's going to be 30 years. Or it's going to be 30 years. And, uh, you know, dur during those 30 years, don't you think that I have to be careful with those false teachers, false doctrines that come very cleverly and come into the church and they tried, you know, they tried in, in Sunday school when we had the Sunday school studies, somebody teaching somebody different and, and you know, that's also my concern with oikos, that at home somebody comes in and, and start teaching something different, and then you can say, oh, yeah, that's new. I like what you're saying. And they start. that's the way they, they come in. But that's why it's important for us to be fighting, okay, to be fighting. Like one day somebody told me, oh, pastor, don't tell me that you don't know that this person has been there. How can I know? Sometimes they think that as a pastor I have a magic ball and that I know everything that is going on. I, and I keep telling them, unless you tell me, I'm going to know. But if you don't tell me, how do you want me to know? And that's the way that as soldiers we have to work together. And when you see something like that, you're a soldier that you have to defend the faith that was already entrusted to us. It's a trust from God, okay? It's not my doctrine. It is God's doctrine, and he has entrusted that doctrine, sound doctrine, to us, and we have to fight for it, okay? But unless you do your part, then we can make sure that it's not going to get into us. But you have to do your part. It is, it is the same thing with, oh, come on, Pastor, don't tell me that you didn't know that this person has been living in adultery. No, I didn't know. Ah. Well, if you don't, now that you're telling me, now I know. But you think because I'm a pastor, I have the power to know everything that is going on in the life of people? No. And especially, I think it's the opposite. People work hard so that I don't know the things that are happening. So, you know, I have experienced that I, usually I am the last one to know. <laughs> I am the last one to know. And they say, ah, come on. Everybody knows. And you don't know? Nobody told me. So how do you want me to know? 
So the same thing with, with distortions of doctrine, false doctrines that are trying to, to come into the congregation. We need to defend that hmm? together as a family, as a church. We have to defend that and to say, no, no, this is not according to the sound doctrine. This is not what we have learned. Okay? This is not. Okay? So the problem is the churches had grown complacent and careless. Careless. You know, as long as we have people coming into the church and becoming members and giving money, tithing, that's fine. I don't care what they believe, what doctrines, what distortions they come from out there. We just got to make sure that this is full and that we have money to do whatever we want to do. And that's it. I don't care about people. They could be singing, they could be teaching, and they could be doing things. And that's why nowadays, in order to not have that problem of defending the true doctrine, you know, most of the churches, they tell you that they believe whatever you tell them that you believe. They bet, but I believe this. Oh, yeah, we believe this way. Somebody comes with a different, but pastor, we believe it. And I, oh, yeah, yeah, we also believe this way in this church. Come on, come on, you're welcome. We are a loving church. We are a loving church. But that's not what, the, what Judas is telling us. telling us, no. Real love for God is defending what he has entrusted us. And he has entrusted us sound doctrine. Given to us once and for all. No changes. Okay? No changes. No changes at all. Just sound doctrine. All right? And next week, we're going to go to verses 5 through 7, and we're going to see the victory here. Okay? We're going to see the victory. And um, it says here that Jude reached back into Old Testament history and gave three examples of God's victory over those who had resisted his authority and turned from the truth, okay? And, you know, we read those three examples, but we're going to get into them. It says it's giving the example of Israel. It's going to give the example of the fallen angels and the example of Sodom and Gomorrah, okay? Sodom and Gomorrah. But for now... There are things that we have to really consider. The first one, who is Jesus for you? Okay, Because we learned that the distortion they brought into the church is not to believe that Jesus was divine, that he was God in the flesh. Who is Jesus for you? Is he really God, the sovereign Lord of the universe, the creator of everything visible and invisible? Do you truly believe that that's who Jesus is, okay? Now, secondly, that we have to meditate, how do you view God's grace? Do you view it in a distorted way? By thinking that you can fall from grace or that you can live any way you want because you are under grace? How do you view God's grace? Because, yes, it is the basis of salvation, okay? God saved you by his grace when you believed, okay? Or by faith, some other version says, okay? And you cannot take credit for this. It is a gift from God, okay? So the grace, the gift is from God, okay? The grace, it's a gift from God. And then it is when you believe, by faith. When you believe. When you believe what? Because that's what the word faith means. Believe. When you believe what? Okay, that gift, you can receive that gift when you believe. When you believe that I am a sinner. Okay? When you believe that I am a sinner. When you believe that because I'm a sinner, I'm under condemnation. I'm on my way to hell. If I die in this condition, I'm going to end up in hell. Okay? If I believe that I cannot save myself, 
You see, I cannot say myself. It's not a combination of faith and works. No, I cannot say myself at all. That's why grace is the very first element. Hmm? Not works. Grace is the first. So I cannot say myself, and only Jesus can save me. So it is by grace, something that God is offering me as a gift that is not going to cost me. Hmm? He already paid all the price. But I have to believe. I have to believe that I am a sinner. I'm lost. I cannot save myself. And only Jesus can save me. So then I can only, and only then, I can truly receive him as my Savior and Lord of my life. And I'm saved by grace. And I have to live by grace. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. It is time for us to speak to God. God has spoken to us through his word. And I don't know what he has told you. I don't know what he's telling you, what he's asking of you. But you know, you know. So whatever he's asking of you, right now is the, is the moment, is the time. In prayer. In private prayer, right there in your heart, answer back to God and tell them whatever you need to tell them. Whatever you need to tell them, tell them. If you need to repent, you need to confess something that maybe you have distorted already, the, the real concept, the real teaching about God's grace. And you've been going to one extreme or the other. God knows that. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we have to be honest with God and tell him, yes, Lord, you know, and I acknowledge that I've been doing this that has led me to this sin and to this other sin. So, Lord, I confess my sin and I repent. And remember that repentance means I'm turning my back on that sin. I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm not going to practice it anymore because now I truly understand what the grace of God is all about. The grace of God is going to lead me to live in wisdom, in wisdom, in godliness, in obedience. So we thank you, Heavenly Father, for dealing with each of us, because we know that you're, we're all different. We have different experiences in life, different temptations. We thank you, Lord, for dealing with us. And we know that you, your dealing with us are on the basis of your character. And we know that it's by grace that you deal with us, that you're willing to forgive us, to forgive us completely, 100% for our sins when we confess them. So help us, Lord, and, and use us to defend this wonderful trust that you have given us, your word, Lord. Help us to defend it. Help us to keep it to preserve it because we know that it's, your word is the only one that can lead us to the right kind of lifestyle, to a righteous lifestyle, to the truth, to real peace, to real contentment. So we thank you and we ask it in Jesus' name and for his honor and glory. Amen.